welcome. This is the Smithsonian Museum exhibit is available through the Rutland Library and the 300th Committee. So we welcome you all. And now we have the Finnish Society to have their talk. Welcome. Good, thank you, thank you, Carrie. Okay, if you can't hear me, raise your hand anytime you can't hear me. Okay, is this better? Yes. Okay, I'll try and keep it loud. I'll try. My grandfather was six foot four and he had the farm on Maple Lab, and you could hear him all the way to the center of Rutland. So I'll, I'll try and use the Haney Loma voice if I can get it, get it up. Okay. Um, I'm Barry Hainaloma. I do not live in Rutland, but Rutland has been our second home forever. My grandparents were the first Finns to buy a farm in Rutland in 1911, and um, they bought the Buffalo Farm, which I have often wished they still had ownership. <laughs> but they sold it in a year to another Finnish family, to the Matsons, the two T Matsons, the one T Matsons. The one T Matsons, this is the two T Matsons, okay, gotta keep that distinction straight. Um, and they went to, back to Worcester with my uncle Onni, who then moved to Rutland and spent most of his life here, many of you know him. Uh, okay, and then they went to Hubbardston and they came back in 1921 and they bought the farm that now I guess is best known as Flo's Farm Stand, or what's the latest name, Eastview so, Farm, East I think. Farm. Yeah. Eastfield. Okay, so that's the family farm, although we haven't owned it for, since 1957. Okay, but the other connection to Rutland is um, our family has been involved right from the beginning. The Finnish Heritage Society, Subitaya, which owns the park down in Demon Pond, was formed in Worcester um, in April 4th, 1890. So we are one of the oldest continually active Finnish organizations outside of Finland. Uh, don't ask me about the future, we just go day by day and somehow we manage to, to survive. But anyway, that organization began in Worcester and relatives of ours were charter of the, uh, were, mem were of the 36 charter members in 1890 and my grandfather came to Worcester in 1905, my grandmother in 07, they were married to Worcester Hall in 11, and when we got the, um, we were under a Michigan charter because that's where the headquarters were for the, the umbrella organization. But we built, built a new hall, they said, if we're gonna give you, if we're gonna loan you money, uh, gonna give you a mortgage, you have to be based in Massachusetts. So um, we had to get our charter, we got our charter in 1911 as a Massachusetts organization, and my grandfather signed that as a secretary. So um, we have a deep and long interest in the Finnish organization and in Rutland, and we are not the only ones. I mean, there were many families that in Rutland for a long, long time, many families uh, that have been in the Finnish society for a long, long time. So. Um, Bear with me. The, the intention today is to tell you what you want to know about the Finnish community. There are some people, I know at least one who was born in Finland. I know a number of them who have traveled to Finland who are in the audience. Um, and I guess I have to assume that maybe there's somebody here who isn't entirely sure where Finland is on the map. <laughs> so no, I, mean, it's, I don't want to tell you what, more than you need to know, but I don't want to neglect anything. And I think afterwards, all, all three of us will talk and afterwards we'll be downstairs for coffee and if you've got questions, approach any of us and we'll try and give you an accurate answer and if not, we'll, we'll get back to you. We'll so. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, okay. A lot of that nowadays. Okay, on my left is Paul Matson, who is on the board of directors for our Finnish society, and he is the one who has a room downstairs named after him, which I'm very impressed with, because he's very involved with the um, group that, what is the name of the group? Cable Advisory Group. Cable Advisory Group, okay. So Paul is very involved in that. His family came early on, and... Um, Peter Heaney here, who does not have a Finnish name, but has a mother who is Finnish and is very much Finnish himself. So, um, okay, our family came in 1911, your family came in the third... 1909. 1909, okay, your family came, Paul? 
came into Rutland, what year? Um, 1911. 1911, yeah. yeah. Okay, so like I said, we're, we're well over a century. <laughs> the interesting thing to me is, a lot of these things we hadn't thought about in context, but when Kerry first asked if we would do a program in conjunction with this exhibit, you know, it makes you think about all these details. It's like, okay, why are there fins in Rutland? And why did they stay in Rutland? Um, immigrants, immigration is not a new concept. I mean, we're seeing it now in the, in the, last, the last decade of the 1900s, there were more immigrants coming to America from other places than there were immigrants coming in the first decade of the 1900s. So this is not a new concept. And like all immigrants anywhere around the world, you don't always know why the first one went to a place, but the second one very often came because the first one was there, the third one came by the first two were there. And um, I have no idea, and I don't know that I will ever know why my grandfather came into Worcester. His wife-to-be came in because she had a bunch of cousins here. My grandfather's sister, Mrs. Terrio, who lived in Rutland most of her life, came because her brother was here. And it's interesting, one of the lists that we want to make, um, I don't know that anyone has ever written down the relationship amongst the Rutland Finnish community, because there were a lot of siblings. Um, people I knew all my life I didn't realize they were related. I didn't ever realize that that the two Mrs. Tapleys were sisters, and Mrs. Luco was another sister, and I knew them until the day they passed. And there were the Limatinen brothers, and like I said, my grandfather had a sister. And, um, you know, you tend to know them by their married name and not realize always for going for back. A um, couple things to explain that, that I just want to say is, um, who here knows what a Swede fin is? Oh, good. Okay. Okay. All right. Finland, Finland has two official languages. It was part of, it was right next door across the bay from Sweden. It was under Swedish rule from the 1100s into 1809. Then it went under Russian rule from 1809 until the revolution in 1917. So at home I have my grandparents' passports as Russian citizens. They were Finns, but they came on a Russian passport. But anyway, so Sweden had a huge influence on Finland, and it was the official language in Finland until there became a second official language. Finland is a bilingual country in 1863, which isn't that far ago. So even though most of the Finnish speakers spoke Finland, spoke Finnish, um, if you were going to go to the court system or, or whatever you needed, it was done. Looking up genealogical records, at a certain point back, they're all in Swedish. And at the time of migration, around, you know, around 19, well, 19, the last decade of the 1800s and the, not, the last quarter of the 1800s, first quarter of the 1900s was the biggest time of Finnish migration. And at that time, roughly 12% of the people in Finland spoke Swedish. <coughs> Historians don't agree, but it's generally, I agree with, I agree with those who say that 20% of the immigrants who came to America from Finland were Swedish speakers. And it's particularly interesting around here because Worcester, Gardner, Fitchburg were, were mandates for the, for the Finns. They all had large Finnish communities. But the interesting thing to me about Worcester and Gardner both, they had a Finnish community and they also had a community of Swedes from Sweden. But they, half of the Finnish immigrants were sh Swedish speakers. So these are two distinct groups who didn't always see eye to eye, shall we say. <laughs> um, when, when, the fin when the Winter War broke out in Finland in 1939, every Finnish group anywhere around the world got to work raising money to help Finland and sending packages and so forth. And in Worcester, the Finns would have an event and they'd raise $1,000. 
And then the Swedish speaking Finns would have an event and they'd raise $1,200. And then the Finns would have another event and they'd raise. There was this little competition, and the Swedes had two advantages. The Swedish speaking Finns had two advantages. One, um, they were somewhat aligned with the Swedes in Sweden, who were more affluent, not in company, all that good stuff. So um, there was more money in that community to kind of be raised and all. The other interesting thing to me is, um, I was meant to just realize, that's one thing I meant to bring from the park. If you look at the Nordic countries, traditionally Scandinavia is Sweden, Norway, Denmark. When you say the Nordic countries, you're talking those three plus Finland and Iceland, those five countries. But we have a sign down at the park that says no smoking. In Swedish, in Norwegian, in Danish, it looks almost identical. It looks like each one, one of them is right, the other two are a misspelled version of that same thing. <laughs> Finnish is entirely different. Nothing, it's like Estonian somewhat, Hungarian somewhat, nothing like Russian, nothing like Swedish, so they're kind of there by themselves. So, um, because Swedish speakers, Swedish is more in, in, in line with English. It was easier for someone who spoke Swedish to learn English than it was for someone who spoke Finnish to learn English. So all these factors work together and it's hard when something happened or didn't happen it's sometimes it's hard to say why it was but these these underlying factors um the other thing that and i think this is to say i i don't know these these current immigrants coming from other countries my assumption is the same thing as with the Finns. in other words if you look at the worcester finnish community you'll find they came from certain communities, certain uh, contiguous communities in Finland. If you go to Gardner or Fitchburg or Maynard or Cape Ann or um, Quincy, you'll find those also had large Finnish communities who came from other parts because you tended to go where your family, your neighbors, your schoolmates were. So. Um, this is this issue is kind of an, a non-issue now as we've gone down a couple of generations, but um, early on, uh, it's, it's a picnic in the park, and they'd have a competition, or, or, or a rope pulling competition, or um, horseshoes, or something like that, and they team up by the town, by the hometown. So you had the, the family from this town as opposed to families from that town, and there was, it was a strong. The immigrants knew, you know, they, they knew who was from their town. Now a lot of us third generation don't know. Um, we don't know that our grandparents went to school with another Finnish family that we know, but just didn't, we, we've lost that, and it's unfortunate. One of the things that I'm hoping to have happen, and this is maybe kind of like a kickoff, um, I got, we, we did a, a book on the Worcester Finnish community. We had a five-month exhibit at the Worcester Historical Museum in 1992 um, documenting Finland's, Finnish, the Finnish, Worcester, Finnish community and Swede Finn community in Worcester uh, from the beginning up until that time. And two years later, we realized we have all this information. We can't just let it sit there, so we, we put out a book in 1994, and I was re reviewing it the other day and realizing I'm really glad we did it then because a lot of the pictures and the information that we were able to acquire from different families from the shoebox of pictures or, you know, the bottom of the bureau drawer or something, I don't know where those are now. If I had to go looking for them, they'd be much, much harder to find. But anyway, um, those of us who are still those of us who are more active in the Finnish community, as you will notice, um, we have some vintage to us. <laughs> and so I would like to think that now this year in Rutland, it's, it's the 300th anniversary of the town. And in, 19, in, in 2026, it will be the 100th anniversary of the park on Demon Pond. So I'd like to, let's, use this as an open, not an open closing, but let's use this time to try and collect as much information on the Finns that relate to Rutland, either as farmers or whatever reason those people chose to live here, and also the summer people 
um, who had camps there. There's about there's the hall and about 30 camps, many on the waterfront, and many many in back. And the the interesting thing, you got to know who who's who. But a lot of those camps, especially on the waterfront, the name on the deed has changed hands three, four, five times. But when you do the research, it went from grandparents to daughter to grandson to great granddaughter. So, and then again, too, like the Finns that lived and farmed in Rutland, a lot of those people with camps, you know, those two are sisters, and that one's a brother to that one, and all this stuff that is known in a lot of different heads is not documented, and I would like to see us somehow get it together. Um, I brought just a couple of books, um, but what was one we did in Worcester, I, one on uh, a Finnish community in Montana, one on Lunenburg, Massachusetts. I have a ton of them, but um, we're home for Florida, from Florida for two weeks, and my filing system leaves a lot to be desired. So I probably have 25 books from different communities, but it would be nice to see something put together from Rutland. Um, I don't know what form it would take. In the past, very often a community would do a book. A uh, good friend of ours, Betsy Hundle, who lives in Westminster, where my wife grew up, she and another girl have a project uh, documenting every Finnish name in any record relating to Westminster. And as of now, they have 5,000 names. And so Betsy, who is my age, is saying, probably we're not going to do a book. Probably it will just serve as a database for anybody who wants to look up anything in the future. There's a group, probably less than 10 years old, on Cape Ann, Rockport, and uh, Rockport, Pigeon Cove, Lanesville, Gloucester, had a huge Finnish community and a lot of organizations and they all kind of, you know, petered out as the people got older. And uh, a fellow who's also my age um, is spends his summer uh, in Rockport and they formed a group and their intention is to get an online database. They have no, realistically, they don't think, no, we don't want to do a book, we're not interested in running social events, we want to gather this information and have it available online. So there's different, the main thing is to collect it and get the documentation and nowadays it's not like the old days where people didn't want to give up a copy of a prize photograph because now you can you can copy anything many times. So hopefully now this will kind of also serve as a kickoff to that project. Um, Trying to think. <coughs> Any questions? Maybe that will go in that direction. Anything that? Yes. What did most of them farm? Chickens. Interesting. I, when, when they came, um, okay. Let me let me back up. Most of them. One of the interesting things to me is most of the Finns who came to America came from a rural farm background, mostly a small farm. They came into a city to get, and they came with a suitcase and ten bucks, twenty-five bucks. So they had to get money for a down payment on some land. And so they worked in the cities primarily, where most of the, I mean, Worcester was a big industrial city. I think their claim to fame is the biggest industrial city not on a waterway, not on the ocean or something. But anyway, there were a lot of industry, a lot of Finns worked there. And the intriguing thing that I don't know anyone's ever studied, if you look at all the immigrants who came into Worcester from most of the European countries, I would believe that most of them came from a rural farm background, but it seems as though the Finns disproportionately want to hold on to that. It seems to me that more Finns went back farming than the Italians or the Swedes or the Norwegians, and, and, and I can't document that and I can't prove it, but it just seems to be, and I don't know exactly why. Um, when they came to Rutland, most of them would be subsistence farmers. I mean, they were part-time farmers. Um, my grandparents, like my, my grandparents, moved to Hubbardston in 1913, <laughs> and I think about this. So they moved to the small farm with a couple cows and a hundred hens and so forth, and they move out there with their, a baby who's less than a year old. And my grandfather continues to work at the wire mills 
in Worcester. And he takes the train home on the weekend. And so they have a son born in uh, 1912, or one in 14, uh, my aunt in 1916, and my father in 1919. By the time my father came along, I think my father, my grandfather had left the wire mill and was working, um, was running the farm now with his wife. But when you think of my grandmother out there by herself, five days a week, milking the cows with, you know, this trail of little kids, <laughs> I don't, you know, don't know how they how they did it really. Um, the Finns in Rutland, as time went on, um, there were I can come up with like four dairy farms. My grandfather had one. Uh, Gary Lemertine's um, uncle, yeah, grandfather's Towno. Towno, yeah. Okay, Gary's here somewhere, but Towno. Gary's grandfather's brothers, son Ben at the end. They and then Matson's that had the buffalo farm. Those were the three that built new big dairy dairy barns. So I mean, they were they were into it big time. Um, my grandfather delivered milk in Worcester. He had a dairy uh, on the farm as well, and I think um, Hendricks, Pete Hendricks, was over on Glenwood Road. Um, Laurel Hill Dairy, yeah. I think those are the only two that I know that, that, that had produced enough milk to sell under their own name. Uh, but I think the other thing about that Pete Hendricks that's kind of interesting, my understanding is in the 20s, he had a dairy down on Maple Ave, not at a farm. So, I mean, he must have been buying milk from some of the other Finnish farmers, I'm guessing, and bottling it and, and peddling it. And then he went to Holden. He had a had a um, he had a dairy on Holden Street, and then he came back to Rutland. And he had the dairy herd. So there's a lot there's a lot of these odd pieces that we know, but we haven't chained them together. You know that then needs to be done. The other thing that Finns were big into was poultry, and I don't. <clears throat> don't know exactly why that happened. I know the extension service during the depression in 1930s was going out and giving lectures and trying to get these different communities um, to get into poultry. They felt that was the way of the future, that was more sustainable, I guess. Mm -hmm. And Rutland had a number of um, poultry farms that were full-time poultry farms. Yeah, I mean, some of the men worked out initially, but then I think, Anita, Anita I wish Anita um, Matson were here today, but she's out visiting her son. Her, her family, the Kettlers, had a big poultry farm on uh, Glenwood Road, and Anita has documented that and has a lot of pictures. Beyond that, um, my grandfather also had an apple orchard, but I don't know what portion of the income that was. I remember as a kid, um, the sprayer for the apple trees and so forth, but I, I don't know. W one thing that is really good in Rutland, whenever any of my friends come from the Midwest, they are totally amazed that we have the, they're common in Massachusetts, but some towns did not do them every year. Rutland put out these books of valuations, so you look at the 1935 book of valuations and you look up the name, which is if it's finished, it's very often misspelled, but you can figure it out. <laughs> but it'll tell you how many acres, and it'll say, uh, you know, the such and such pasture, 10 acres, the so and so field, 20 acres, the total, the, the home lot, how many cows, how many chickens, how many pigs. You can, I can document from when I, my grandparents came in 1921 and bought a farm with an old barn, um, and then. Uh, they bought that in 21, I think it was 24, 25. They had a, a sawmill come in and set up on the farm and, and mill all, uh, cut down and mill up the lumber to build a new barn that held 32 head, which was a very good size farm at that time. And then in the tax records, you'll see two barns for a few years and then it's one barn. So you figured, you know, okay, that's about when the barn got turned down. So for anybody doing research, they are they're a tremendous thing. And, and sometimes the town clerk has them, sometimes the historical society has them. Um, they're they're a good a good resource. Um, any other questions? Boy, 
Why is it quiet? <laughs> okay. Well, then, Paul, do you want to say? <laughs> okay. What is that? Okay. Can you hear me okay? Actually, I would like to ask you folks, raise your hand if you're a blood fin, you know, have a little fin blood. Wow. wow. That's a lot of people. How about folks who are married to fins? <laughs> All right. and now I'm curious, as Barry had said, Fitchburg, Worcester, Gardner, because of their mills, how many of you folks who are fins your folks came first to those towns before you came out into the country. Oh yeah, most of most, them. most of you. Yeah, How about into Paxton them? too. Both of them. <laughs> well, I I was brought up by Finnish parents. I'm Paxton from the time I was a baby, and I lived on Sulmi Street, which is Little Finland. And at that time, there were tons of saunas every Saturday night and so forth. That so. was going to be my next question. How many folks in here have ever taken a sauna? Oh, God. How many folks have had a sauna in their house or maybe their grandparents' house? How many of you folks here family have owned a commercial sauna? There's two of us. The guy with this, three of us. So the fellow on the back, Joe, he and my grandparents on Laurel Street, Clayton Street in Worcester. Yes. Yep. There was Clayton Baths and then, then uh, I don't know the name of Joe's off the top of my head. Tell me. I can't hear him. I should know it, but anyway, so there are those of us who've had saunas, who have taken saunas, who have owned saunas. And that is not the, the heart of, of uh, fin Finnish culture, but it, it's, it's somehow a unifying piece of Finnish culture. Uh, some of the things that I had written down, and I, I went to an old phone book. And I just went across and read some of these names, and maybe you folks, raise your hand if you know the name, and you can tell me if that was a farm, or if it was what the relationship was. I have one, it's called Punkari. Anybody know that name? Yeah. Yeah. They had a dairy farm on Ridge Road, right? Okay, how about Moisio? Yeah. There's a Moisio now. Yeah. Okay, so they were up by over, where Overlook Services is. How about Tapley? Anyone know that name? <laughs> See, there's some Tapleys right there. Yeah. All right, how about uh, Savella? Savella. You know that name, Henry Savella? Way in the back. Yeah, I don't know that they had a farm, but they were showed up in the uh, phone book. Uh, Takala. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mackinan. There's a bench downstairs in the lobby dedicated to the Takalas. When you go downstairs for refreshments, there are two benches. I can't remember the name on both of them, but one of them is, is dedicated to the Takalas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mackinan. Anyone know that name? And you know where that farm is on the hill? That uh, Bob Love, I think, bought it in. His family lives there now. Then there's another family named Yoki. Has anyone ever heard that name? Yes. <laughs> so they had a, a family farm. Chickens. <laughs> on Brittnell Drive, Brittnell Road. Yeah. Dirt Road. And the sauna might still be there. That's good to know. It's still there. Let's see who else we got. Masson's. <laughs> yeah. tea one tea one and two tea. teas. We have a we have a one tea. One tea is down where Vans is. Uh, yeah, where the yeah. where the Buffalo farm was. Okay, um, put Kisto. There we go. So that was right down the hill where the senior the senior housing there. Now they tore the the houses down. Uh, Lima Tynan. There were two brothers. There they are, all back there, the whole bunch. Uh, yucky, we, we did yucky. Oh, sorry, I'll try to try to do that better. And Barry had mentioned uh, Hendrix and Catella and Hainaloma, and then there was a family named Helle, Helle. They had a woodlot on uh, uh, 
Augusta Road. That's the name of that road, Bigelow Road. And they had a steam bath in Worcester, a commercial. That was called, a, it wasn't a real sauna, it was a steam bath. You know, you you put water on a radiator. It wasn't the same as the real old fashioned <laughs> steam bath. Uh, uh, who else we got? Um, I think that's about it. Uh, I also wanted to mention that when the uh, prison camp was put in, they, they took 900 acres and there were some farms down there. A family named Maitland Hill, uh, who had uh, a chicken farm in Hubbardston had started there. And I believe uh, Paul, what, what's the name of the family? Yeah, who had, they had, if you think of if where the prison camp is and it goes out to Ocam, Colebrook area, they took that land too. So the Finch farms that were there got taken after the prison camp was gone. The prison camp itself got taken because that land went to the MDC for watershed to protect the water for people in Boston. So a lot of the land that was farms got taken away in that, in that way. I also wanted to um, mention about when people were coming from Finland to here, one of the little messages that their families gave them or that was instilled in them is try to get hold of some land. Because, because as Barry had said, Sweden originally for 700 years ran Finland and they owned pretty much everything. So when immigration started, which the most of it happened, like 1890 to 1910. But in the late 1860s, they had a, a two-year famine, which was devastating. And that was the impetus that got people thinking, we really got to get out of here because there's no place for us to go. What would happen is a family, the oldest son, by tradition, would get to run the farm, even if they didn't own it, because Swedish people owned most of the land and the, the farmers had to give a share to the owners. But if you were the oldest son, where were the daughters and the brothers going to go? So when things opened up, they started to come to the United States and to Canada. And that's one reason why we're all here. And in my particular case, on, on um, Bigelow Road, my grandfather had, he and his brother had bought 40 acres of a woodlot. And they weren't farmers because they grew up in uh, Turku and it was more of an industrial city. Uh, it was the old capital of the, of the country. But in their case, they wanted to have a place where they could come, open up some land, and have a little subsistence farm. He had chickens. He had quite a few chickens when I was a kid. He had a brood of house and, you know, a, a hen ranch, a, you know, a range for, for them. Um, many, many of you people have been to chicken farms or your family's own chicken farms. So you, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I wanted to mention was um, that early on, the Finns, where did the Finns come from? The, you know, the question is, well, yeah, Finland's over there. Well, like most tribes in Europe, they went from the east, gradually worked their way west, and the Finns got pushed, where's the map? They got pushed by all the tribes that are following Germanic, Slavic people, and the Finns end up up in the swamp there, but they, but they made they made a life for it, and and today they they consider themselves or they're voted the most content or happy people, and they're usually in the top ten. And 1917, they became independent, and even before that, when they were the uh, autonomous Grand Duchy of uh, Russia, 1904 or 1905. The women got the vote. First country in the world. Not only did they get the vote, but the vote gave them the right to hold office. Which is, that, that goes to show you how liberal Finns are. I just wanted to give a little of that background. Some of the stuff I wanted to talk about is kind of ancient history, but let me just touch on it. So these people, these Yorgrik, they're called finno yorgrik people. Samis, Finns, Karelians, and some others. They're, they're hunter-gatherers, and then as the Stone Age develops into the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, they, they're there on the land and they're farming, they're farming. But what happens is they're, they're uh, shamanic people. Even to this day, the 
Samis, a shamanic people. Christianity came from Rome. So when Sweden conquered Finland, it was called the Northern Crusades, started like in 1100. So Rome, they used the church as a front. You know, really, they just want the territory. But so that all became Roman Catholic. Then when, a few years later, you know, uh, 1500, when the uh, Reformation happened, it all turned to Lutheranism. And Lutheranism tried, like Catholicism did, to eradicate shamanism. But it's still there. Not as a main religion, but it's still there. It's in the stories, the Kalevala. It's, it's an important part of our history. Um, so when we think of the development of the, fin the Finnish psyche, the Finnish mentality, a lot of it has to do with spiritualism and equality. And we are so fortunate that Finland has set that example for us. Hmm. And really, that's about all I have to say. If there's anybody who has any questions or comments they want to make, uh, the gentleman in the middle had mentioned a war that had happened. What, what was the war about? Okay, um, there were three wars in Finland in recent times. In in when let me go back a little bit. When we had the um, Napoleonic Wars, at one time they had five Napoleonic Wars. The Swedes were aligned with France, Napoleon. They lost. They divvied things up. England got the the naval rights. That's how come Sweden lost New Sweden's uh, colony in, in New Jersey. But uh, Russia got all of Finland. That was like uh, 1908, I mean 1808, 1809, somewhere around there. So from all that time, it was a Grand Duchy, which means it was run by a, um, a synoid or a, a court directly from the Tsar. But they, they were autonomous. Up until uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Finns had a revolution, the, re the Reds and the Whites. The Reds were the socialists, the Whites were the more pro-Swedish, nationalist, uh, you know, capitalist types. The Swedes, the, the Reds lost, the Whites won. That was 1917. The, um, as it turned out, when they put the documents together to give themselves a charter or a constitution, most everything that the Reds wanted, they got. And that's why today they have free school, free health. I mean, you pay taxes to get it, but they have, you know, uniform culture for everyone. You don't have super rich and super poor and, you know, people in between paying the taxes. So, I don't know if that answered your question. I think she was asking about the Winter War. I, I oh, I went right by it. We didn't get to the Winter War. So, what happened, then Karelia is the piece between, you know, it's Finnish speaking, uh, or not, it's Korean speaking, related, closely related to Finnish, okay? So, uh, World War II is about to start. Germany and Russia have a secret pact, okay? So they, they don't have to worry about each other. So Russia takes advantage of that and attacks Karelia, which is this piece. It would be to the east of that, that map. And they, the Russian people came in, the, the, the soldiers came in, fin finland had to mobilize immediately and it was a hundred days i think 104 days 100 days war it didn't last long but they actually stopped the russians from coming in and to this day you know it's they all it, they use that as a it's propaganda uh, but during like when the during the cold war when russia had much more power the finns kind of toned down on saying what great things they did in the in Karelia. But some of the stories you have, and I, I did bring some things with me, but I'm not going to take them out right now. But like I, one guy, his name was Utilein, and uh, who was a airplane, he was a, a pilot. He was the top ace in World War II from everybody, Americans, Russians, English. The top ace was a Finn in a secondhand plane called the uh, Brewster Buffalo, which was a plane that the United States had that was obsolete gave them to England, and a bunch of them ended up, that was the uh, Finnish 
Air Force. And then another guy, I forgot what his name is, but he, he was a sniper in this winter war. He himself shot like 540 people as a sniper, you know, buried in the snow, and he was there for, I don't know, the war only lasted 100 days. So that was the Winter War. When the Winter War was over, World War II was not over. 1941, the Finns thought they could take their land back. So they, they did an assault, 1941. Or 1940, I'm sorry, 1940. It didn't go good. So when the war was over, a whole piece of Karelia got ceded to Russia from Finland, and that's the border to this day. So that's the war that Barry was talking about. Then when World War II was about over, Finland had no one to turn to, so the Germans became their allies. And they had a swastika on their planes and on their uniforms, but it was backwards because they didn't, you know, philosophically, they were there because they needed the protection. So when the war was over, or getting to be over, they had another war, which is called the, uh, what's the place in the north there? Continuation War. No, not the Continuation War, the war in the Arctic. The Lapland War. Yeah, the Lap War. They had to push the Russians out. I mean, the, the Germans out, and they had to go to Norway. They, you know, they pushed them out through there, but they were able to do that, and then the war was over. So, for a little country to fight off all that, it, it's amazing. You know, they have stamina, perseverance, and bullheadedness, and they have a word for that. What is it called? Sisu. Sisu. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Paul uh, well, Maxson is next. Thank you very much, um, Vera Ildefeva. And so, okay, what I'm going to do is to take a little bit different track here and talk about families in Rutland. And I have what I call a tale of two muttis. Okay, there's a Maddie Matson and a Maddie Vitolo. All right, and my parents came from those two families. All right. So at any rate, okay. So a Finn named Merti Konasari left Nurmo, Finland in March of 1900 at the age of four with his brother Thomas on their way to the United States of America to join their mother Lisa, sister Lisa, and brother Urho. <clears throat> they left behind the sister Sana, and after arriving in Boston, the family made their way to Worcester, Mass, where we think they, they took up residence in Quinsigamond Village. No information yet found on whether Father Thomas came to the USA, and little is known about Maddie's life in Worcester until around 1906 or 1907. Hilda Leitola left Yildiz yeah, Finland in 1902, and at the age of 12, and on 19 November 1902, she left Hanko, Finland for Boston. She came to Worcester briefly to live with her older sister, Mary Taipoli, and unable to speak a word of English, Hilda got a job as a maid for a family on Alvarado Avenue, who tried to teach her English, but all she wanted to all she wanted to do was cry because she was so homesick. Matti Karnasari met Hilda Laitala in 1906-1907, and they married in Worcester on 8th of February 1908. When she was about 20, when he was about 23, rather, and she was 18. Shortly after they married, they both became U.S. citizens and legally took the name Matson at that time. Matty worked at the American Steel and Wire and they lived on Esther Street in Worcester, where their first son, Aino Matthew, was born in 1908. Their second son, Uno Thomas, was born in 1909. Their third son, Walter John, was born in 1912. Sometime around 1915, Mukti and Hilda bought from Mr. Harry, who had bought from Mr. Green years earlier, the existing 88-acre green farm on Emerald Road in Rutland, and they moved in. Their daughter Lillian Elizabeth Ethel was born in that farmhouse in 1917. They grew vegetables, raised chickens, pigs, and had cows and milk for the growing family. They also sold vegetables, chickens, um, all, uh, all ready to roast, strawberries and blueberries and corn in season from a roadside stand. Hilda took in laundry and ironed lots of shirts for a salesman. Mutti continued to work at American Steel and Wire for a while, then worked for the town of Rutland, mostly as a laborer on the street and highway department. 
Hilda also did domestic work for families in town. Matthew's first car was a Model T Ford touring car that had side flaps and <coughs> used it <coughs> and used it if it rained too hard. Tom and Walter uh, went to finish summer school here in Rutland at the town hall, which was in, inside of Rutland Center School at that time. Hilda did not have a license to drive very, uh, very well, even though Lillian got quite scared uh, coming down Connors Hill, which is Sellows Hill, or which is now Mullins Hill. Um, the, some of these locations in town have gone through a few name changes over the years, so at any rate. Several acres of land was sold to a developer so that he could access cool sandy beach and the family had summer swimming privileges as a part of the beach. And Tom left work to go to the Veterans Hospital to work at the Rutland, Veterans Hospital in Rutland. Walter was an outstanding basketball player and a very good all-around athlete. And Lillian was an honors student, class officer, and also an un, un, outstanding basketball player. As the family grew up and left the farm, Hilda continued to operate the farm to provide food for their growing families. And due to Maddie's continuing health problems, they <clears throat> finally sold the farm to Carl Arlen in 1941. Hilda and Lillian moved to an apartment in Worcester. <clears throat> and <clears throat> Hilda moved to a small house in Rutland after Matthew passed away in 1951. She worked for various families in Rutland and Paxton as a housekeeper. She had time to do handiwork, made some beautiful rugs, uh, some of which are still in my house, and during this period in her life. And for company, she had a parakeet that would talk Finn to her. <laughs> I, I do remember this, you know, Pretty Pepe on, on Riva Poeca, you know? <laughs> and uh, he, he, would, he would repeat that over over and over again. So at any rate, um, Hilda lived a rich and full life. She lived at full speed, working half a day, and had just taken a sauna on the day that she passed away in the sauna, as she wished, and it was sudden. The other Mapti, Mapti Vidala, came to Worcester in 1910. They moved to Colebrook, where he purchased land from Jacob Mackey and built a farm on some 60 acres. <clears throat> raised cattle, hens, and vegetables for sale. During this time, it was not unusual for trustee prisoners from the prison camp to help Mutti on his farm and work the prison camp vegetable fields as well, occasionally coming to the well on the property of the farm for water. It was during those years Uncle Matthew and Mom Irene joined the family, and when NDC was to take over the property for co op and watershed, the property was bought up, and the Beatles moved to Rogan Road in Barrie, where they purchased a smaller farm than what they had been on. They continued to raise cattle and hens and sold milk and butter. And of course, the eggs gave, uh, the chickens rather, <laughs> chickens rather gave eggs to sell. So they held on to this property until they were forced to sell and moved to a small cottage style home on Maple Ave in Rutland. During the time, during that time, Tom Matson and Irene Vitola became came together to various Finnish gatherings and were married on June 18, 1932. They celebrated their beginnings and first son Bob joined them in their duplex cottage on Lakeside Avenue in Rutland. And through those years, both employed at the Veterans Hospital in Rutland, and they would both work there until their retirement. The Finn families had an Irish and Yankee friends, and as the hospital closed, it always seemed that they were always with each other and enjoying each other. And so these are the years that, you know, it happened that they finally started to think about getting, well, they had to leave the area down on Lake, Lakeside Avenue because they had to, the MDC was also taking all that area. So they found property over on Prescott Street and they built a house there, and the house is still there today, and it's still in the family. 
And so that is pretty much con condensed brief briefly what the what the uh, family consists of and um, throw out a few other names of Finnish farmers that I can re recall and there's probably another hundred or so that I don't recall but at any rate the name of Salo, the Lima Diamonds, Putkisto, Matson, Oliver, down where the uh, man farm was, and Matti Matson, who had um, now what is now known as um, Butland Nurseries, okay? And there was also the Kettonen family, Makkanen family, Ketella family. Engeloma family, Tapley, Tukan, and Yoki families. So that pretty much takes care of everything that comes from uh, the two families and how they came together and where everybody is today. So anything else? If anyone has any questions or anything else? If not, Barry? Could you name some of your ethnic foods? Foods? Who's the coffee? Ethnic foods. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> ethnic foods? Yeah. The ones I liked or the ones I didn't like? <laughs> yes, sure. Um, no, um, one of my favorites was Sil Salad. And the lady sitting right here in the front row, Hilke Hagman, made by far the best Sil Salad I have ever eaten in my whole life. And I used to wait annually for the smorgasbord to be held in the, in the Protestant church. Oh, yeah. in, in December, so that I could go get Sil Salad, okay? I know you like it so well. Oh, I, I had a lot of Sil Salads in my lifetime, and by far, yours was the best. And I, and I also probably caught on to one of your secrets this past year over at the uh, barbecue when you were um, making your three bean salad there. Oh, um, oh. <clears throat> no, nah, she, um, she has a little additive there. We'll, 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 just, we'll just say that that's all there was to that. <laughs> but at any rate, um, those are the things that, you know, okay, so there are various finished dishes that you tried and some you liked and some you didn't like. Now, a little side story on this is when I met my wife, um, her, her mother was Swedish, as Swedish as they come, okay? And so she always kind of felt that, you know, um, well, yeah, I'm a Finn, she'll tolerate me, and so on and so forth, all right? So this went on, and this went on, and finally when I asked Gail if she'd like to get married, and she said yes, we went in the house, and she said to her mother, I'm going to marry Paul. The first words out of her mother's, wife, mother's mouth were, Oh my God, my daughter's going to marry a Finn. <laughs> so, you know, um, these, these were the things that, you know, she was, we, we joked about and kidded about. And the prenuptial supper or on the evening before the wedding um, was the greatest loot, loot. Oh, okay. combination, I guess you would say, of Finn food and Swedish food. <laughs> And my wife and I had some very eloquent discussions about Finn food and Swedish food over the years. And so, you know, I learned how to eat Swedish foods and love them. I'll admit that publicly anyways. But at any rate, so, you know, these are the things that you kind of enjoyed and did. Tell them what still is and how it's made. What it's made. <laughs> Oh, Sil, so, uh, no, Philia? No, Sil. Sil. Oh, okay. Well, <clears throat> Sil, they take a, uh, what is it? A, uh, yeah, pickled, herring. Yeah, pickled herring, right. <laughs> they take a pickled herring and they just. It's not pickled, it's awkward. It's awkward. See now, this is right. That's why I, that's, there's a difference there, okay? So that's why one of the things that I came to um, like about um, Hilka's silk salad was the fact that it was salted and not pickled. So, you know, there's, 
little differences in these things as you go along that you find out. Took me 70 something years to find out that was <laughs> But at any rate, um, no, these are, these are the things that, you know, we enjoyed as we went along. And, um, you know, there was uh, philia, which was um, something of the consistency of a yogurt, but uh, not really, but it kind of, kind of went along with that. And I remember my grandmother telling me about how philia came to this country and it was in somebody's handkerchief in the back pocket. <laughs> so in other words, you know, there was a quote unquote starter that got passed around from family to family, and it was built from there, made from there, and so, you know, these were the things that um, you grew up and finding out about and, you know, hearing different stories about. And there's, there's, there's one other that is kind of interesting to me anyways. I was uh, <clears throat> baptized and confirmed in the Finnish Lutheran Church in Worcester. And so going there for a number of years would be, you know, you were used to a, a pastor who spoke Finn, and you kind of understood pretty much what was being said, and everything that he said, you know, was said with a kind of a Finnish accent. And so then, when they closed the church and my parents had to decide what to do, they decided to go to the Congregational Church up here in Rutland. So one of the first times that I went to the Congregational Church up there, I was used to a Finnish pastor who always said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, the, the minister up here said, Jesus Christ, and I said to myself, is this the same guy? <laughs> So, I mean, you know, there's a lot of little side lights and a lot of cute little stories like this. So, I will, uh, I will give it back to Barry now. And anybody else has anything they'd like to add? Okay, thank you, Paul. All right, I have one question. You heard all three of us. Can you tell which one used to be a broadcaster on radio? Yes, yes. I have forgotten what a beautiful voice Paul has. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Um, another little food story. You know, growing up, you eat what you eat in your family. You don't think about where it come from or why you ate it. And we ate, my mother was a Yankee. My mother's family came from uh, England in 1635 into Massachusetts and we're still here. My father's parents came from Finland. So uh, they met at the Finn dance in Hubbardston. They got married in 1941. Uh, we lived, uh, the day after I was born uh, in 1945, uh, Roosevelt died on the 12th. I was born the day after. The day after I was born, my father left for Japan because he was in the Army Air Force. And my mother and I lived with her parents in Gardner, and we came back, my father came back, and we rented a camp at the park. And then we lived a couple years at the farm on Maple Ave, and then we moved to Holden. But anyway, one of the things we ate a lot of never thought about it, was what we call scalloped potato with ham. You'd have a ham on Sunday, and then during the week, scalloped potato, and you chopped up the ham that was left, and we put it in, and it made a really good casserole, and we all liked it. So we have a son and daughter, and my son decided he was going to go to school, school in Finland, and, um, oh, there's his, okay, he was going to go to school in Finland, and he did for two years, and uh, the last semester he met a local girl, and they got married in 2002 in the oldest church in Finland, and we're very happy with that fact. But anyway, so we went to Finland for three weeks, and uh, there may have, of the 21 days we were there, there may have been one or two days, we visited a lot of houses, a lot of restaurants, may have been one or two days that we did not have what I would call scalloped potato with ham. <laughs> and I loved it, it was not a problem, but then I came home thinking, that's interesting, they eat like us. And then later on it dawned me, no, we eat like them. I mean, I'm sure that my grandparents ate a lot of ham and scalloped potato, and my father grew up with it, and my mother, being a good wife during World War II, would make what her husband liked to eat, and so we grew up with it. So, um, 
there were some distinctive Finnish foods, but there were some other things. There's also variations. Lois Rasku, Lois Chinago back here and I had a conversation the other day. And we were talking about traditionally um, one Finnish food at Christmas time, you have to have rice pudding for dessert. And the Finns make what they call like a fruit soup, which is prunes and, I've had it with prunes and apricots and different other things. And raisins, right. We've had it we in Florida a couple of times just over the holidays. And then Lois says, well, my mother canned uh, peaches and some other fruit, so we always put that in. So, you know, there are these Finnish recipes that get modified. I mean, the Finnish coffee bread is very simple. Um, Finnish oven pancake is very simple, but you can't find two Finnish women who make it the exact same way, and there's no right or wrong way. Um, downstairs, you have coffee. Um, there is Finnish coffee bread that um, Barbara Rushala, who's back there somewhere, made, and Paul brought some from the bakery in Templeton. Um, Finnish coffee bread is different from Swedish coffee bread only by who eats it. The Swedish <laughs> eat it, it's Swedish coffee bread, the Finns eat it, it's Finnish coffee bread. But it's really interesting how much that has has survived. I mean, it's good and I like it. It isn't something to rave about, it's just something you have to have. I mean, when we have coffee down in the park, you have to have coffee bread if you have 10 other things, but one of them has to be coffee bread. And in every generation, my wife is one of seven, and one of her sisters said, okay, I'll be the one now to take over Mama's recipe, and, and like somebody in the family has to continue it. And it, it's just interesting, all these things that you live with, you don't think about. Um, I'm thinking we're, we're getting, We've been about an hour, which is about what the time we had originally allotted. So if anyone has any questions, come, come downstairs, continue seeing the exhibit, which I think is really excellent from the Smithsonian. And I think coffee will be, if it's not right now, it'll be ready shortly. And there's coffee bread to go with it, and some almond cake, and some cheese and crack. It's a very simple diet, but it's kind of what you would probably have at a Finnish home. Finns, last I knew, are considered the largest per capita coffee drinkers in the world. And Finns will invite you to come for coffee. And if a non-Finn invites you for coffee, that's maybe what you're going to get, is coffee. But if a Finn invites you for coffee, it's just the liquid to wash down all the other things on the table. And you've got to have some sweets but before you have some sweets, you're gonna have something salty. So I remember years ago, one summer, I worked for town of Limitine and Hain, and before we'd go out to the field, or about 10 o'clock, there'd be a break, and you'd have to have coffee, which was often hamburgers, and coffee bread, and what I would consider a meal. So, Finns, Finns like their food, but we're not, salt and pepper are our spices, we're not. <laughs> no one's ever gonna, um, complain about how hot or spicy something we have is. So, um, just some of these things on the table to mention quickly. Um, this picture has hung down to the hall for many years and I didn't realize until now I'm standing here looking, I'm sitting here looking at it. On the back it says, Mrs. Irio Riano, 254 Maple, Maple Ann Ave, Hampton Manor, Rensalia. She was one of the four Luco sisters in Rutland and um, Barbara Ruchala's aunt, and uh, she painted, and every year for, let's see, last year, we, last year we had the barbecue again after a two year hiatus because of COVID, so I think we've had 54, I think. But anyway, um, we have had up to 450 people, now we're down to 250, but we maybe can get back up again. Um, anyway, here it came one day and painted this, and it's hung in the hall ever since. Um, this this is a float. I'm always there are two pictures hanging down to the hall in Rutland. That the the we bought the land in '26. The hall opened in '27, and the parade uh, the Rutland. Massachusetts celebrated the 300th anniversary in 1930, and I'm assuming most every community had some type of celebration, and I know Rutland had a big to-do, I think the governor came and all, but anyway, they had a parade, and um, the, the Finns had two floats in it. This one is impressive to me in the fact 
in, in the year 2000, um, we rented the horse and wagon from the Heifer Project farm, and I tried to recreate it, and there was a whole lot of duct tape and hay to make that. What they may look so easy and, and so nice, you see the picture down below, but um, somewhere in the town, in the historical society, I was reading something I hadn't read before, I read recently how the, the town people specifically invited the Finns to participate. So um, this, I think, was the one put together by the farmers, and yeah, you can... <laughs> You can see the back end of the horses and the driver, which is Gary Lee Matinen's grandfather, I think. So come take a closer look at that. And then this hot picture I just grabbed from home. This is my grandfather. My father. Well, this is this is my father and his family. Uh, my grand my grandparents' 25th wedding anniversary taking in front of the farm, which is now Flo's farm stand. Mm -hmm. So like, th there's a lot of this stuff floating around in people's homes and we need to duplicate it and get it all together. Okay, if no one has any... Some of these books that uh, we have here, uh, the library has them, you know, about the, about the Finns. So if you're interested, even though these are our copies and we kind of cherish them, if you're interested, you can get to look at them through the library. Remind you of something else. We, we have gotten for many years the Finnish American Reporter, which is an English language Finnish paper that comes from Hancock, Michigan. And I never realized until I was in the library the other day, sitting back there, right where the newspapers are on the right, there's a copy. I don't know how long the Rutland Library has subscribed to it, but take a look at it. It's a good little paper, and they would like... You're welcome to be the library copy, or the, the newspaper would love to have you subscribe to it. Yeah. So think about that. Okay, if nothing else is... Do you want to? Oh. I just have one thing. And I, <clears throat> pardon me. And that's to wish everybody a good about what you're ordering Happy New Year. Thank you to Kerry to and the library staff for all they have done. I mean, I think, uh, and, and also to the Rutland 300th Anniversary Committee, who were the ones who are apparently originally applied for the grant to get the exhibit downstairs. So thank you to all of them. Now we'll go drink some coffee. <laughs> Thank you.